these words today from Luke chapter 4 will also serve as our sermon text for today. He, that is Jesus, went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. His, the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, Do here in your hometown what, you have, what we have heard you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, No prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elijah the prophet, yet not one of them were cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogues were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You know, when I'm looking at my phone at, at news, um, at, at sports, or or social media and things like that, I, without fail, at least a dozen times, will see you know, ads or, or article titles that say, um, five helpful tips for life, you know, whatever little aspect of life that may be, in the kitchen, uh, for, for cleaning, uh, whatever it is. I see them all the time. In fact, they've started to bug me every time I, I see them pop up. And yet, as I, as I looked at our text for today, they couldn't help but come to mind. As we look at our Savior, as we look at the rejection He faced, we can see some helpful tips for us. When we inevitably see rejection of His Word in our lives, we'll look at our Savior and we'll see three tips to help with rejection. To not let rejection stop us, to not let rejection surprise us, and not let rejection disappoint us. As we look at these tips in the life of our Savior, we find ourselves uh, in the midst of, of Jesus' Galilean ministry. Just a little bit ago, Jesus had been anointed and, and publicly announced as the Messiah, as God's promised Savior. Uh, he had gone out into the wilderness and had that uh, incredible battle against Satan and his temptations. And now after that, he is going through the, the region of Galilee, the northern part of Israel, going from town to town, Proclaiming the good news, who he is and what he had come to do. And of course, performing miracles along with it to give credence to his message. And now his travels take him to his hometown, a place where he grew up in Nazareth. And he did um, what he was accustomed to whenever he came to a new town. He went to church, in a way. On that Sabbath, he, he went into the synagogue to worship with a former family and friends and uh, must have been asked by the leaders of the synagogue that day to, to read from Scripture and to teach. His reputation must have been growing. They must have known that uh, he's kind of a smart guy when it comes to Scripture. So he stands up to, to read from Scripture and he's handed a scroll from Isaiah. He enrolls this, this large scroll and he, he gets to the point where he wants to be and he reads this. He reads our Old Testament reading, in fact. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because He has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. 
this prophecy was spoken to a, a future group of Israelites who would be captives in a foreign land away from their own, a people of Israel who had rejected God's word, uh, failed to, to be obedient to him, and because of their sin, they would have nev- eventually be uh, led away into captivity. And yet, regardless of their rejection, God offers these words to his people. He announces release, freedom. They will not be there, uh, there forever. God will return them. He promises to bring them back to the land to, to free them from their captivity uh, so that they would no longer have any more debts. And yet at the same time, while God was promising this, he was also promising something greater. He was promising a spiritual release. He was promising spiritual freedom, a release from the captivity of sin, the cancellation of the debt of sin that that all people have before God. He's promising to bring this about by His anointed servant, the one who would come to announce this amazing message of release, of freedom. As Jesus finishes reading this up, we presumably don't have everything Jesus said here recorded by Luke, but when he finishes up, he closes up the scroll, he hands it back, he sits down, and he looks over the whole crowd who's staring at him, waiting. And he says that it's fulfilled. He says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Right there in front of his family and friends and and, uh, those he, he grew up with, Jesus is declaring that he is the fulfillment of this text. He is the anointed servant whom God had sent to bring this message of release, this message of freedom. The people sitting before him had been lost in the captivity of sin, uh, suffering under the debt of sin. And he had come to free them from that. And when they heard this, this, these words, they were amazed at Jesus at first. They spoke well of him and what he was saying. But then they looked closer at the one who was sitting in front of them. They remembered who this person was. And you hear it in their first question they ask. Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't this the boy that we ran around the streets with? Isn't this the the kid we watched grow up? Who is this man to tell us that he is the so-called Messiah? Who is he to tell us that he is lost? And who are we that we need to be saved by by this guy? And hear the words of rejection. And you wonder if going into this, Jesus knew that he was going to face that rejection from his probably family and friends, those he knew for a long time. And let's pretend for a minute that he didn't know that that was going to be the case. Would he have gone and done that knowing that there was a chance that it could all fly right back into his face? Here is where we find our first tip for today. To not let rejection stop you. You know what really puts a damper on any kind of motivation or productivity? It's going into it knowing that what you're going to do isn't going to be worth it. I'll give you maybe a, a, a minor example. You're cleaning up the house and you're getting ready to sweep and mop the floors and then it comes to mind, oh, the kids are outside playing in the rain. What is the point of sweeping and mopping that floor when those kids are going to come in in 15 minutes and just make a whole mess of the place again, right? Those thoughts can eat at us and in worse situations can make us wonder if if the task we're doing is worth it at all. And rejection can lead to those same kind of thoughts and hesitations and maybe even want to give us temptations to stop before we even begin. Today we're talking about how rejection is a reality. That is how many people are going to receive God's word. And so if that's the case, what's the point? 
Why am I going to bring the word to someone when they are just going to throw it back in my face? It's not worth it. I could spend my time doing something else. We can come up with plenty of excuses then what we could do instead of sharing that message. And yet we look at this text and we see Jesus not letting rejection stop him. Regardless of what their reaction was going to be, Jesus needed to go to Nazareth. He needed to walk into that synagogue and he needed to let them know who he was, what he was doing there. What this this section from Scripture means for them. How important this message really is. We remember and recognize just how special this message is, how important this message is. Because it is a message of release. It is the gospel of freedom. For this Savior, Jesus came to save the world from the captivity of sin, which everybody was held under. To save them from the captivity of their spiritual enemies. To free them from Satan's hold. To to free them from the fear of death. Jesus went to that cross to pay the debt of all sin. His blood made that that payment in full. And we have been blessed to know this message. Our Lord has brought this message to us through the Holy Spirit. He's brought us to faith in that message, knowing that our debts have been canceled. We have been washed in the waters of baptism, now being free of the hold of Satan, now being children of God who know that this message isn't just for us, it is for all people. And that's why rejection isn't going to stop us. No, this message is too important to be held back by some silly little thing like rejection. And whether it's rejected or not, this message is for the world. This message is about what Jesus has done for them. And while this very same Jesus wasn't going to let rejection stop him, it didn't matter what it was when he saw it, it wasn't going to surprise him either. Jesus knew their thoughts and Jesus knew what was going to come next from their rejecting hearts. He says, surely you will quote this proverb to me, physician, heal yourself. Those people weren't going to accept Jesus for who he said he was, but they certainly wanted to to see him be the miracle worker uh, that they heard about, um, healing the sick, casting out demons. They wanted to see those miracles. But instead of of caving into what they wanted, Jesus warns them of their rejection and what it could mean by using some, by using two famous examples from their history. The first example is the prophet Elijah whom the Lord could have sent to to any home in Israel to provide help and support in the message in Israel, but instead goes to the home of a Gentile widow. And there brings the word and there offers assistance. The second example is the prophet Elisha, his successor, who there were countless sick people in the land of Israel, and yet who does the Lord send to him to be healed? An enemy commander of a Gentile nation. And he was healed and he came to know this great message of release. When Jesus was using these examples to warn the people of Nazareth that rejection of God's word means that the word is going to go away. That had happened with God's people in Israel. They had rejected his word, they had rejected his messengers and what they brought. And so the Lord brought, instead used them to bring that message to other people, to them to know this message of release. Jesus was pointing out this has always happened and will continue to happen and will happen to you if you continue to reject this message, that it's going to go elsewhere. And here is where we find our second tip, not to not let rejection surprise you. No, when things don't go the way you think they will, can leave you wondering, it can leave you questioning, can leave you in doubt. For example, you could think of a, of a certain team uh, who let you down yesterday. 
but instead let's, let's be a little more general about it. You think about, still let's think about your favorite sports team and they have this perfect season, incredible run, they get to that championship game and then everything falls apart. They were completely slaughtered, there was no chance of them winning at all. And you sit there and you think to yourself, what went wrong? Whose fault is, is it, you know, what, what is going on? Why was this the outcome? And the surprise of rejection can lead us to, to doubt, similarly ask the same kinds of questions. Sure, we, we know rejection is a thing, but when you actually experience it, it can be surprising. What do you mean people can say no to God's word? Isn't this word supposed to be powerful? Isn't it supposed to bring people to faith? Why isn't it doing that? What's wrong with God's word? What is wrong with God's promises? Is he not fulfilling them like he said he was going to? And that can lead us down a, a dangerous spiritual path for us if we begin to wonder about God and his promises. But as we look closer, as we look at our Savior Jesus facing rejection, there we find comfort for those doubts, to see that God is always working. His word is always working. It never returns to him empty. Yes, the word has power to bring people to faith. And it also, at the same time, can lead people to dive further and further into rejection. And even if it does that, God is always working for good. He is always working for his word. And we see the examples of that with, with Israelite history. God used that rejection to bring his word to those who knew nothing about their Lord, who, who didn't know about this message of freedom. And greatest of all, look what God used, greatest of all, look how God used rejection for his son. Look how God used the rejection of, of the, the anointed servant to bring about salvation for the whole world, to bring about forgiveness for the very people who rejected and put Jesus on that cross. God is always working through His Word. And even if hearts are closed to that message, God is opening hearts elsewhere to bring that message of release. And this is what we find even more surprising than rejection is how gracious our God is. That He would continue to do that regardless of what rejection there will be. But it's knowing that there will be rejection, that rejection is a normal response and we're not going to fear and we're not going to doubt in the promises of our Lord and we're not going to doubt in His Word. No matter how severe that rejection may be. And our Savior Jesus certainly faced some serious rejection. And just look at how His family and friends and hometown received that Word and what He said to them. They were so furious with him, they wanted to throw him off of a cliff. They wanted to kill him because of what he said. They, they take him out of town, they get him to the edge of that cliff, ready to do it. And yet, that was not the time for, for Jesus to die, the time had not yet come, and so miraculously somehow he, he walks right on through the crowd. And, and notice what Scripture says, it doesn't say that he went into hiding. It doesn't say he spent a week feeling sorry for himself or, or reevaluating his life choices. It says Jesus went on his way. Jesus went to the next town and to the next town, bringing that same message of release, bringing that same great gospel news to everyone who needed to hear it. And so here's where we find our, our third tip for today, to not let rejection disappoint you. Again, we talk about how when things don't go according to plan, it gets us doubt and wondering. But even more so when things happen in our own life, when, when plans fall through and when relationships are strained, things aren't going the way we think they should, they get us to, to wonder about ourselves. Have I not done enough? Did I not do the right thing? Was I not good enough in that situation? In the same way, rejection can lead us to feel disappointment in ourselves. 
when we don't think that that gospel conversation went the way we thought it should, we wonder, what's wrong with me? Did I not share the word the right way? Did I not teach it clearly? Am I not good enough to be this person to share God's word with someone? Maybe we even begin to wonder if all of these, this rejection is because God is, is disapproving of my life in some way. Yet we know that that's not the case. We look to his word and we see Jesus facing rejection too. And we find help and comfort, something that eases that disappointment, that drives it away. For consider Jesus' ministry. He was rejected Quite a bit. Quite a lot throughout the course of his ministry. Does that mean that Jesus, of all people, wasn't working his hardest to bring that message? Was he not trying enough? Does that mean that God was disapproving of his ministry with all of this rejection? Jesus faced that rejection on our behalf. First and foremost, he faced that rejection for our salvation so that we would be his brothers and sisters, so that we would be freed from the guilt of sin, from the debts of sin, from the, those that held us spiritually captive. But secondly, Jesus faced that temptation to be, or that rejection to be our help. For he knows the kinds of rejections we go through here in this life. He knows exactly what it's like. And he knows how to be our help. He knows how to be our strength. He knows how to be our comfort in those instances. Consider our reading from Acts. Well, Peter, John, and the rest of the apostles all faced rejection, knew what rejection was like, and honestly, they faced worse rejection than we may ever see. But as they, they, they pray, they, as they pray to continue their work to, to, to spread that message regardless of rejection, the Lord lets them know that He is with them. That He has sent them to be those messengers. That He is there to, to help them and be their strength. And that reminder is for us today too. So that when rejection comes, we won't get disappointed. Well, it's not like we're going to go out and, and expect to see it everywhere. We know that when we encounter it, we don't have to be disappointed. This is how God's word is, as always, will be received. But we will continue to go on our way as well, joyfully and happily bringing that message to, to the next person and to the next person who needs to hear about this message of freedom. We've got a Savior who has faced it too. And He has promised to give us help and strength as we do it, first through His word, as we come back and hear that message for ourselves again. Where we stand now because of Christ, what He has done for us, and He renews us in His sacrament, strengthening us once more to go out and face that rejection head on with this special message. We've talked a lot about rejection today, and I hope it doesn't seem like that's the only thing we're ever going to see. But God is going to bless our work as we bring that message to the world. And yet, we still live in a world that wants to reject that message. But as we look at our Savior, we find help and we find some useful tips as we face it. Rejection isn't going to stop us. Rejection isn't going to surprise us. Nor is rejection going to disappoint us. We have assurance and hope as we go out and face that. It's because of the one the message is about. As we go out and face that rejection, and though it may be great, we bear the message of one who is even greater. The anointed servant who has brought about release for this entire world. Amen. Amen.